I'm Randy, the pastor half of the podcast, and my friend Kyle is a philosopher. This podcast hosts conversations at the intersection of philosophy, theology, and spirituality. We also invite experts to join us, making public a space that we've often enjoyed off air around the proverbial table with a good drink in the back corner of a dark pub. Thanks for joining us, and welcome to A Pastor and a Philosopher Walk into a Bar. If I were to ask you, what are the top two or three things that the American church is in dire need of, what would you say? Taste? Uh, yeah, <laughs> taste. I was going to say a sense of humor, sure. uh, good music, and a responsible orientation to politics. Okay. <laughs> be my top three. <laughs> I mean, a little bit more superficial than I was expecting, but that's really? okay. Really? I don't know. You cornered me. <laughs> I know, I know. See, I've thought about this, obviously, and... My top three would be, in no specific order, love, goodness, and humility. Such a Sunday school answer, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is it? I would say the church just needs more Jesus. But, okay. yeah. but right. to each their own. Yeah. But really, aren't they the same thing? Yeah. No, fair fair enough. Yeah, you're not going to get any argument from me about those three things. Yeah. They, they come up from time to time on the show. They do. They do. I mean, we, we're not going to talk about two out of the three of them, but I want to talk about humility. I've just been observing lately, and I don't know why it's just lately, but uh, maybe it's because I've spent more time on Twitter and I've seen a lot of toxic stuff. But I think a major problem in the church today, in the American church, is that we just lack so much humility. Hmm. We think we know everything, and we think everybody else is wrong all the time. And we think that because we give something authority, it has authority over everyone. Mm -hmm. You can go on and on about the lack of humility in the church and how I think it's ruining our reputation and our witness and people find us uninteresting because we're such arrogant dicks. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about humility today. Let's do it. All right. Humility is one of those seemingly insignificant virtues that very few people seem interested in or very good at. And I myself am guilty of it, right? If anybody that says I'm humble, no one believes them automatically. But I think that the lack of humility within Christendom is actually like a cancer to the church that is making it impossible to disagree with, or it's impossible for us to disagree with one another. It breaks relationships. We trash our reputation and witness. And I want to talk about the importance of humility as human beings, but in particular as followers of Jesus, Mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to be a humble religious person. Because when you're a religious person, you kind of think you figured it all out, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's hard in general, but yeah, being religious makes it maybe a little harder. Quite a uh, we, bit. Something we can talk about. I don't think it's unique to people who, you know, subscribe to Christianity or any other particular mm-hmm. faith. I know lots of arrogant atheists. <laughs> so, like, you can be religious in a lot of ways. <laughs> Today, Mason Menengo, or whatever his name is on Twitter, said, <laughs> you atheists are sometimes as annoying as Christians. I saw that. Yeah, exactly. It's hilarious. Well, let's talk about... Yeah, let's do it. And honestly, this will be, if, if you're new, this will probably be a decent introduction to the show because we, this is a recurring theme. If we had to pick like one sort of thing that we revolve around a lot, I think it's probably humility. It's what we keep coming back to. So welcome if you're new. So around here, if you are new, we do a alcoholic beverage tasting every episode of, for one, because it's delicious and why wouldn't we? For another, because our podcast is called A Pastor and a Philosopher Walk Into a Bar. And so we want to create a dynamic and a, a feel like we're all sitting at a pub table together and yep. just hashing things out. So, Kyle, what do we have? We have something special today, don't we? We do. We say that every time because we have good taste and like most of the things we drink are special. But this one's extra special because it comes to us from one of our beloved Patreon subscribers, oh, right. uh, Doreen. We're, we're finally drinking the thing that you sent us. Uh, so, Doreen actually sent us two bottles. So, this is one of our favorite Patreon subscribers, not just because she sent us beer, but because she always comments on our posts and we have nice exchanges. And, Love Doreen. Uh, found out that her son in law is apparently head brewer at one of the best breweries in the country. Come on. Yeah. Uh, and that's not really controversial. Uh, they've been around for a little while and wow. they're kind of, yeah, they're kind of, they've been at the top of their game for a while. And this is Bottle Logic and they make some of the more interesting stouts and also IPAs that you're going to find on the market. Where so, is Bottle Logic? In California. Okay. Yeah, a lot of good beer in California. Bottle Logic is amongst them. So Doreen sent us very kindly a couple of beers, and we're going to open one of them here. And this is a barley wine. I don't think we've had a barley wine on the show yet nope. that I recall. Well, we had that one by Central Waters. That was, was that similar a to a barley wine. That was a long yeah, time ago. long time ago. Yeah. 
So barley wine is a, a style that I had to warm up to. It wasn't immediately a thing that I liked. It's got this very thick toffee-like caramelly thing going on usually. But barrel-aged barley wines, I've come to realize, are some of the best best beverages <laughs> that one can have. I mean, um, so definitely some of the best beers. I mean, they're fantastic. Uh, and this one, interestingly, it was aged in a peach brandy barrel. So this is called Flesh to Stone Peach Barley Wine, English-style barley wine aged in peach brandy and finished with fresh peaches. So this is an adjunct barrel-aged barley wine. And this one, so Doreen sent a nice little note with it here from her son-in-law, who is the brewer. Uh, he says it won gold at the Great American Beer Festival in the Wood and Barrel Age Strong Ale category. If you haven't heard of Great American Beer Festival, it's one of the most prestigious competitions in the industry. So, cheers. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Oh, it smells delightful. Doreen, I love you, but man, I don't like this beer. <laughs> oh, I love this beer. Oh my God, I love it. I just don't like That's hilarious wines. that you don't. Mm -hmm. It's funny because she says, I'm a simple woman. I'm just glad that he keeps me stocked with great IPAs. She hates this too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you then, Doreen. <laughs> she doesn't like stouts or any of that stuff. It just smells so rich No joke. And this sweet. is one of my favorite barley wines that I've had in recent memory. Wow. I absolutely love it. <laughs> I've never had a barley wine, and I, I, I think I'll drink this whole glass before I figure out like all the complexities yeah. like, there's a lot i mean it's not here. it doesn't have the most barrel of any barley wine i've ever had i like that the fruit is very subtle mm -hmm. if i blind tasted it i would not immediately call out peach mm -hmm. it just yep. has a little bit of citrus presence mm -hmm. citrus peach is not a citrus yeah but that's all you get from it hmm. like i don't it's not noticeably peachy to me oh huh, okay no it's not it's um i mean it if it re resembles anything peachy it's like a peach pie because it's got mm -hmm. that like thick viscosity that yep. that syrupy thing going on yeah but toasted flavor very toasty yep. yeah mm -hmm. which i expect from a barley wine like a good one i think i'm going to leave mine on the table for a bit because i see on the bottle it says to serve at 58 degrees and we're probably a little under probably that little so under it's that, like yeah. it like up. more like a red wine like we can revisit it that sounds more gross to me but <laughs> <laughs> well you don't have to finish it i will happily yeah no, no it's it's one of those things where it's just so interesting like i, yeah. I would take an opportunity to taste something that is just kind of this far out there anytime. yeah now i get it I, I did not acclimate to barley wines quickly but now i love them yeah i i admit that i'm a hack who doesn't like stouts barrel aged stouts or barley wines but uh it's you just, try pbr just, though <laughs> dude I, I mean i i love pbr i who think they make a whiskey now That's really hilarious. yeah i okay. think i read that We'll have we to get around it. to that. Now we're becoming one of those podcasts that talks about a bunch of nothing in, for five minutes. <laughs> I know. Apologies. We don't want to be that person. No, please. But there is a link that please you can edit click this. to skip this. If yeah. You, the timestamps are in the show. We're going to edit this, right? This sucks. <laughs> I mean, you can edit it however you want. <laughs> All right. Staying in. <laughs> so, uh, one more time the brewery Bottle Logic, the beer. Flesh to Stone Peach Barley Wine. And the amazing amazing Patreon supporter who sent it to us. Doreen, thanks so much. Cheers. Right, cheers. cheers. Okay. Speaking of amazing Patreon supporters, we want to shout out one of our top shelf supporters, Amanda Lindbergh. Thanks so much for being such a dedicated and consistent supporter of the podcast. We couldn't do this without you. Cheers. Cheers, Amanda, and a great Twitter follow. Heck yeah. One more shout out because that's what we like to do. We love our people. We love our community. And uh, Carissa Vega left a review for us and she just became a Patreon supporter like today. Woo! How about that? So Carissa left us this review on Apple Podcasts and says, I found my tribe. She said, growing up with an atheist father and a Pentecostal mother has been interesting. And politically, my parents are also complete opposites. From my love of Jesus to my love of cosmology and Carl Sagan, I've never quite fit in anywhere. But after consistently listening to this podcast for months now, I have found my people. I appreciate Randy and Kyle's introspective natures and their love for all people. The topics discussed are culturally relevant with a spiritual substance unlike many typical Christian podcasts. Thank you for the diversity of thought and for connecting your listeners to experts from multiple fields. Thank you for leaving that kind review, Carissa. That's fantastic. And yeah, seriously. Seriously, so thank you. And if you can... Pause right now if you're on Apple in particular podcasts and leave a review for us. They mean the world to us and they help other people find us and they're just the best. Yeah. Thanks so much. So Randy, what did anything happen recently? What made you want to talk about humility on the show? 
I mean, I do think it's a common theme that we um, keep should keep coming back to. So I've had a bit of a moment, a minor moment on Twitter lately where I literally one night flippantly tweeted out something about inerrancy and how the Bible gets so much more fun and fascinating when you let go of the mm-hmm. idea of inerrancy. Nothing crazy or radical, right? I mean, it's just kind of yeah. true. And it blew up. I had yeah, no so idea how. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people loved it and a lot of people hated yeah. it. Yeah. And the, the hate and the venom that came from uh, a tweet blowing up on Twitter was just shocking to me. And it's probably because I don't read through all the all the stuff that people talk about underneath these big tweets. But Yeah, it's not a good thing for your mental health. It's bad, <laughs> you man. Shouldn't do that. Yeah. And there's the venom disgusted me, the the just the meanness and the people throwing you into hell and calling you heretic and apostate really, really quickly. Just craziness. But as I reflected on it, the biggest thing that shocked me, I think, and that depressed me about the response to that tweet and others like it lately has been the lack of humility in a lot of these so-called Christians on Twitter. Yeah. The, the hard and fast hold to certainty that so many Christians display all over the place, but especially publicly, especially in a place like social media, where we're certain that this is the truth. We're certain that this is not even, uh, we don't believe it anymore. We know it. You know, yeah. we know it, this this truth. And, and even as I was trying to talk about how you can still believe in the authority of the Bible while not holding to inerrancy, and I was trying to say the Bible is authoritative to me, because mm-hmm. I choose to believe in it, and I choose to give it that authority, and others might not. And that was a shocking thing to a lot of people as I was interacting a little bit with them of saying, wait, 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 if the Bible's authoritative for you, it's authoritative for all people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was, you couldn't get it through people's heads that, no, 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 I choose to believe it, which means I choose to give it authority. Yeah, I, th- I mean, they're probably, I don't know, because I don't know this person, and right. I didn't read their comments, but like, you know, maybe conflating authority and truth, this is something we talked about in our inerrancy episode, if you haven't heard that, but um, it's it's easy to say, I used to think like this, you, you probably did too, maybe you can remember what that was like, but it's easy to say, look, the Bible is true, if it's true, it's true for everybody, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> right? there's no such thing as truth for one person and not for another person. So if it's authority derives from its truth, then it's authoritative for everybody. And it's mm-hmm. not up to me. It is what it is. And uh, I'm subject to it just like you are. And, and that makes me feel humble while I'm beating you over the head with it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Because it's coming from a place that I can justify as we're in the same boat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's how you legislate from your you know, sacred book because you think that it's authoritative for everyone. It's how Sharia yeah. law comes into it to effect. But when we're Christians, we don't think about this in the same ways. We have this kind of double standard. So I want to just kind of flesh it out. And it seems to me that as I've ever been reflecting on it, humility is a really hard virtue to hold for religious people. We hinted at this in the opening, but I want to talk about uh, just for a second right now, a little bit about why being a religious person makes us, we we need to actually be mindful of how humble or prideful we're being because we think we literally hold the keys to the universe once we say yes to Jesus. Yeah. I don't think that's a necessary part of being religious. I think I'm still religious, (laughs) for for example, in some way. Um, But it is very common for sure. If it's not a personal, I hold the keys, it's at least a communal. My tribe. They do. Yeah. Right. We do someone before me, this long tradition before me does. And again, that gives it the the feeling of humility because I'm subjecting myself. It doesn't like the word religion, like word nerds are going to crucify me here, but like doesn't it have something to do with you're binding yourself to something larger, right? No it's, idea. Uh, I think it's something like that. And I mean, it's literally a subjecting of myself to something larger than myself, which sounds very humbling, Mm -hmm. you know, and it is humbling in some ways. We can Mm -hmm. talk about the Mm -hmm. ways in which it is, but yeah, so it's easy to think that I'm not in possession of the truth, but I've been graciously granted access to this community that is. Mm -hmm. Um, And so arrogance is often veiled as humility. Yeah. And religion makes it so easy. And what we don't realize even when we're, let's just only talk about Christianity, but I don't think it's unique to Christianity. But We even think that our interpretation, our modern interpretation of our faith tradition is the correct one. It's the keys that unlocks the door to everything good. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's again, something that we don't really pay attention to is that like we're all navigating things when it comes to the scriptures, when it comes to our faith and our, our faith tradition through our interpretive lens. 
yeah. that is very, very specific to our context, right? Yeah. All of this just tells me we need more humility. A couple of questions, I guess. First, I mentioned, like, what what might humility look like on Twitter? Because I have no idea how to do that. But also, how does someone, and again, this is old me and people that I still know and am related to, <laughs> how does someone who doesn't think that they are interpreting anything <laughs> uh, even even acknowledge that humility is a good thing that they don't already have? What's the wedge, I guess, or I don't know, how does someone in that position see that they don't have it already and that it's something that they should seek and you know know what it would look like so that they'd recognize it when they see it? These are hard questions. Mm-hmm. But. Yep. We'll get into it. I, w- I first want to ask you, as our resident philosophy PhD, how would you describe humility? What is humility? Mm, yeah. Uh, so this this is, a, believe it or not, this is a, you should believe it by now because <laughs> you've known me long enough. This is a topic about which there's lots of philosophical debate. Uh, there are you don't say. Yeah, yeah, there are uh, philosophers who spend careers just talking about humility. Maybe not whole careers, but at least chunks of careers talking about humility. It's kind of a popular topic recently. Um, the Templeton Foundation funded a big old grant to get a bunch of philosophers and psychologists and other people to think about what humility is. Hmm. Um, interesting stuff out there. Just read a paper today that was about that. So I have a take, and it's partially derived from some of those things, and it's partially derived from just the way it seems to me. And I could be wrong. <laughs> I try to be humble about my take. Well, let me let me tell you a story first um, and kind of illustrate at least an aspect, what I think is the core aspect of humility. Did you ever see uh, Jimmy Kimmel's... Um, he would like send people out and like interview them at uh, various places. And he sent some people out to Coachella one time. Their task was uh, approach random people at Coachella and ask them if they had heard of this band that they just made up on the spot. <laughs> if you haven't seen this, stop this. Google Kimmel Coachella. Watch that and come back. Wonderful. You can imagine what the results were, right? Lots of people asked about bands that the interviewer had just made up. And, you know, said things oh, yeah, like, I oh, saw them at uh, that other music festival. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> So that happened, and then I saw somebody on Twitter one time, uh, someone called uh, Leah, Mm -hmm. uh, say, one of my favorite things to do is make up random Dutch Reformed theologians that never existed and ask my guy friends about them. And so one of of them, she said, uh, have you ever heard of the Dutch Reformed theologian Janus de Wienhauer? I don't know how to say that. And her friend is like, yeah, yeah, not as much as I should, though. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, and, the, and she was like, uh, any thoughts about this other made-up reformer's refusal to condemn Arminius? And this other person was like, disappointing, but not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> to and, a person uh, that doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To a person she literally just made up. Follow this person it on Twitter. She's brilliant. Funny. Yeah, sassy, Leah. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll right. put that in the show notes. So this is a decent illustration of what's not <laughs> the opposite of humility, right? Um, it's this like... Uh, I don't know. You can just picture the person leaning in to like nod with you and like a, you know, just look like they know what you're talking about. And the opposite of that, and I've known a couple people like this, is the person who will like interrupt you to tell you they don't know what you're talking about, mm-hmm. right? Uh, they they get this perplexed look on their face and they ask you to define the word that you just used. Or they, uh, you know, I've never heard of that person. I'm sorry. Can you tell me what that's about? I don't know what that feels like at all. And I, I've known a couple people like this, and um, I've known a couple like brilliant people like this. I've had a couple professors like this who, you know, run circles around me intellectually and like I know their output. And so when they do it, it's like, oh, (laughs) it's not, you know, it's not a defect in you. Mm -hmm. You're seeing something different here. I think that's a decent entry point into thinking about humility. That It it grasps something core about it, something really important about it. Um, Specifically intellectual humility, which we're going to talk about, but humility in general, really, it's kind of a, a freeness of being who you are. Nice. That's I good. think that that is important in relation to other people. That's not ashamed. That's not uh, boisterous or like you know putting yourself out there pretending to be more than it is. It's just mm-hmm. you. You are what you are, and you're comfortable in your space, and you acknowledge both your limitations and your strengths. Yes. Yeah, you know what you know, and you know what you don't know. Exactly. Um, but you're not like you don't need anybody else to know that you acknowledge mm-hmm. your limitations and your mm-hmm. strengths. So I think that's an important part of it. And so. You know, some philosophers will argue that humility is a kind of virtue. Uh, it's a it's a character trait that makes you a good person, in other words. And they'll you know try to parse 
what makes it a virtue, how it's different from other virtues, whether it can be identified as one kind of thing that has, you know, offshoots that are sometimes associated with it, but are really different, or whether it's, you know, this uh, polythetic thing that includes lots of different attributes or whatever. Don't know what that meant. See, thank you. <laughs> polythetic. Yeah, a thing that includes lots of different parts, but isn't like any particular one of them. You know, philosophers go on and on about that stuff, and so do psychologists, and there's a lot of interesting empirical work, too. So some people think, uh, for example, that humility really is just associated with your your orientation to your limits. So I know what my limitations are. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm attentive to them, in other words. I notice when they occur, and I own them. Mm-hmm. So there are some, um, some philosophers who wrote a paper arguing that really it's about owning, making it yours, being okay with it. And they, they wanted to say, but when you own your strengths, that's something else. Uh, they don't think that that's properly humility. That's pride, which is something else I think we should maybe talk about because Christians have had a weird hang up with pride. Hmm. Um, and hmm. I think it's hampered their ability to understand humility. Hmm. Um, so they want to separate those two. Other people want to put them together. I want to put them together. I want to say it's really one virtue. Some people think it's not a virtue at all. Um, so there's a, a group of philosophers who think that Humility is not really even like a, a character trait or a state. It's just the absence of some vices. Hmm, mm-hmm. It's like you're not arrogant. Yeah, uh, you're, you're not all the things. Yeah, yeah, you're not all the things that uh, make people want to run away from you mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or hold a mic in front of you at a music festival. So, you know, it's not even a state you can be in or it's just a disposition away from bad things or vicious things. Um, so there's this whole long debate that's really interesting, kind of nerdy. My, my take is that it's it's got two poles. One of those poles is uh, an outward orientation. So I'm mostly focused on other people. Mm. When, I, when I have occasion to focus on myself, I'm honest about it. I don't think honesty and humility are the same, but they're mm-hmm. closely connected mm-hmm. in that way. So I think the second pole is kind of an accurate self-assessment or self-representation. And I think if you put those things together... You either have humility or you're well on your way to having something that I would call humility. And I think Jesus had those in spades. I think he's an excellent representation of both of those things. I've known some people in my life that I would consider humble people. And when I try to figure out why, it's because they did both of those things really well. I think the the one about being outwardly focused can be illustrated by trying to think to yourself who the most humble person you've known was. And I'm interested in your take on that. When I tried to do it earlier today, it took me a minute to think of a person. And I think that's indicative of the trait Mm -hmm. because a person who's really focused on others doesn't stand out so much. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, So I eventually settled on one of my childhood pastors um, because he was so good at getting into the space of a middle and high school thought space and inhabiting it, but as an adult. Mm Mm-hmm. Actually, Fred Rogers would be another great example yes, of this. Yes. Um, someone who kind of became what was needed in the audience. And so you wouldn't think until years later, or I didn't think, that he must have had his own inner life. <laughs> it must have been really interesting and had nothing to do with me. Um, but he was always present for me in a way that I needed, whatever age or whatever situation mm-hmm. I was in. And I think that's a decent example of humility. And it took me a minute to remember that because yep. I was absorbed in myself yep. <laughs> that whole time, the whole time I knew him. Uh, yeah. So what, what do you think of when you think of humble people in your life? Does anybody stick out? Yeah. I mean, it, it took me a minute, but, um, a guy by the name of Brad Alice, he is, he was my senior year. I went to a Lutheran high school hmm. and he was my senior year religion teacher. And I would say he was my first pastor. Yeah. Um, and he just, uh, similarly to your, your person, um, just loved his students yeah. and he would give me a pass out of class anytime I wanted it to just chat with him, talk about life. And he would just ask me question after question. And then I didn't know anything about him really. It, I did know a little bit because he was, he would be vulnerable, but it wasn't in a, he didn't control the conversations. He was just interested in me as a human being. And he was interested in my flourishing and he was interested in my well being. He didn't have an agenda. Yeah. That seems humble as well to me when you, you just sit with a person as they are and who they are rather than having a gender or think mm-hmm. about what should be. You just sit with what is. That's a beautiful trait. Yeah. And I think it's a humble trait as well. And it's damn near impossible to do on Twitter. So that brings yeah. me back to <laughs> what we keep would, coming back to yeah, Twitter. Yeah, what would humility look like in a space where you're primarily interact 
it's very difficult to do that, right? Because you're already oriented towards a kind of a certain kind of engagement. Yep. And just sitting and letting be is not really allowed on platforms like that. Yeah, I mean, my two recommendations are the things that I try to do. My first thing that I do is I just keep moving. If I disagree with someone or if I if it's an eye roll or whatever, I try to not comment. I try to not retweet them. I try to like not humiliate them. I just am a little bit disgusted inwardly and I mm-hmm. just keep scrolling because... I don't need to engage in that. Yeah. And I wish people would do that with, would return the favor. That's, you know, like <laughs> if, if you disagree with my take on inerrancy, yeah. just keep moving. Cause you're going to yeah. find someone who does. And they're not tweeting for you, buddy. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, the other thing though, is that I have found people who they engage in arguments and it's kind of annoying. And then all of a sudden they kind of come to their senses mm. and they say, Oh, you know what? I think I'm doing what I do in social media and that's arguing for the sake of arguing. I'm sorry. Yeah. They'll literally apologize in the moment. And I've then been that guy. <laughs> that <laughs> like that 20 takes tweets humility. later. Yeah. But I like that. Like being able in the moment publicly to be able to say, I'm sorry, I've taken this too far. Yeah. Or, um, you know what? This is just me trying to win an argument here. That's mm. beautiful. I love seeing that from, from people. Yeah, that's a gracious attitude. Yeah, that's yeah. not the attitude I've generally been met with when I realized what I was doing. But now that's, yeah, grace and humility have an interesting relationship too, which I'm going to say something about later. You keep I admit, saying that. Are you sure you're going to I keep... am. I put okay. it in the outline. Okay. I did want to say about pride though, because I remember when I was, uh, I don't know, I must have been in high school or something, and I read Mere Christianity, mm-hmm. right? C.S. Lewis for the first time. I was reading through all of his stuff. I don't know if I started with fiction or not, but then I realized that his most interesting stuff to me at the time was his apologetics and so he has a chapter in that book i think it's called the great sin if i recall and the case he makes is that pride i think he even spells it with a capital p Mm -hmm. (laughs) is at the root of all sin Mm -hmm. um and you know he he didn't he's not the first to say that he was pulling from a long tradition uh, of a christian i called it a hang-up earlier which maybe is a little too brusque but it's kind of an obsession really Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. pride um, and you know, the, the idea is that the serpent in the garden was the, the, the most, that was the sin. It was pride that started all of it and got the whole ball rolling. Um, and fast forward to, you know, the 1990s or whenever the LGBT pride movement kicks off and you have this ready-made critique for evangelical Christians who are disposed to not be welcoming to LGBTQ people because they define themselves according to what we think the great sin is, right? And this isn't C.S. Lewis's fault or anybody else. I think if you read them carefully, you can kind of see what they're getting at. But there's always been this idea that humility and pride are somehow opposed and that pride can never be good. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so anyone who takes pride in themselves, especially anyone who identifies with it, who uh, builds a community around the idea of being good in Mm -hmm. themselves, Mm -hmm. uh, that there's nothing wrong with me as I am, that that's sinful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mentioned Fred Rogers a minute ago. He got a lot of critiques from people like James Dobson for that very thing because he yep. told kids that they were good, yep. that they didn't need to earn it, that they mm-hmm. weren't, you know, did anything they had to achieve. They just were. And so that idea gets under the skin of a lot of, I want to say evangelicals, but it pre existed evangelicalism mm-hmm. and it, it affected Lewis, who was an Anglican. Um, and I want to say that's unnecessary. There, yeah. there you can, there's a good kind of pride and it's not. That it's not incompatible with humility. I, I want to say maybe it's not even, it's not even distinct. Yeah. <laughs> it's maybe part of the same virtue that acknowledging when I'm limited goes hand in hand with acknowledging when I have succeeded, when I've achieved something and being proud of it yeah. um, and not, you know, using it to hurt anybody, but just being what it is. And this is especially important when it comes to communities of people who have been historically marginalized. Mm-hmm. Another focus that we come back to a lot on the show um, because women and African Americans and LGBTQ people and disabled people and on and on have been told or at least put in social positions their whole lives where pride is not a risk for them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like the sin of pride that Lewis was talking about is not the thing that they struggle with. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Um, it's a little silly to, to try to, you know, hold that over them. Uh, what they need is to be built up and to, to see themselves as equal, um, as as just as valuable, as just as good as all the people who do struggle with pride. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying there's not a bad version of that. There is. We would call it vanity or conceit or selfishness or something like that. Yeah, but when you have this sharp division between humility and pride, and then you have somebody who really struggles with seeing themselves as valuable at all, uh, humility 
both of them, they take on this warped sense where the one ceases to be a virtue and the other is unattainable. Yeah, and I, I want to say, I want to disassociate the idea that self-love and love of others and acceptance of others and acceptance of yourself it is associated with pride and this yeah. terrible thing. Like, that's that's just actually just having the mindset of God, you know, mm. and, and having a gracious, loving predisposition towards humanity and towards yourself. Mm. That I'm lovely, I've been made in the image of God and my neighbor has been made in the image of God and this person that I'm talking to has been made in the image of God. My my predisposition is gonna to, gonna to be to try to find the beauty and to try to find the good, try to find that that goodness that's original to them. Yeah. That's not prideful. That's just having the heart of Christ. Mm, biblical even. <laughs> I would say. I would say. Yeah. Yeah, no, we need to do away with that in the church. Won't make any friends on Twitter, but I know I like that. Yeah. So and another you know, the other aspect or the other side of humility here is a phrase that's come up a lot on the show is epistemic humility, right? And so this is what really kind of got me thinking about humility initially, uh, because it's a part of the epistemology literature that I was reading in grad school. And so um, it's really just humility. Sometimes it's just called intellectual humility. It's humility about what you know and your beliefs Mm -hmm. and um, coming to terms with this, not even explicitly, or I don't even know if I was aware of it. I just started to be humbled. <laughs> yes. Um, it wasn't like a conscious effort to make myself more humble, although I had periods of that too, which is a weird thing to try to become more humble because it's, the more you try, it's like the, mm-hmm. <laughs> the mm-hmm. less you're doing it. But yeah, you're regularly Moses humbled. Was the most humble man on earth, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So, But you know, surround yourself with people who are better than you at the thing that you identify yourself as and you're trying to become an expert in. And you're regularly humbled. You just are. Um, and so that is what undid my fundamentalism. Yeah. Even after I'd thought that I had already undone it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there were vestiges of it left that I didn't realize were still there. Um, and it took that kind of repeated humbling experience to dig it all out. Um, and so epistemic humility then is that same kind of orientation to others. It's just about what I know or what I don't know and uh, trying to learn from others primarily is the, is the orientation. Um, and that's something obviously that has lots of ramifications and relevance for all the topics that we talk about on the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's something so fleeting in this world, especially in the Christian world, especially the post COVID world, right? Like how many Google experts and doctors do we, do we find? I mean, I was with a person who, in the course of conversation, something came up about cardiologists and they mm. kind of, huh, cardiologists, what? doctors, whatever. You Who know. has a problem with heart doctors? <laughs> this person. And and I, I kind of jokingly said, do you really think you know more about, more than cardiologists about medicine? And they were like, yeah, yeah, I think so, oh mostly. And I said, when you have a heart problem and you need heart surgery, are you going to go to that cardiologist or are you going to go to your essential oils person. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, I just hope I never have to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> Me too, just, buddy, but what's your but answer? But the person, the person I was talking to doesn't, literally doesn't have a bachelor's degree. Yeah. And they, they've done a lot of research online mm-hmm. and they know what's best for them and, the, you know, their people and um, they, they think they know... This isn't unique to cardiology. It's it's right. across the board. Yeah, that would They're be very, an odd thing to single out. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's it's across the board. They they don't take vaccines and they yeah. don't believe ac- doctors and experts in science. They think it's all a you know conspiracy. Yeah, that to me is like lack of epistemic humility at its finest. Mm-hmm. That I, a person who don't have a degree in anything, think I'm smarter than a person who's been schooled for you know twelve years mm-hmm. at something in particular. That's amazing, but we do it. Yeah. And a little ironic because the thing that, I mean, I have to try to remember when I thought something similar to that, it was never obviously that extreme, but trying to be sympathetic and charitable, like it, the thing that turns that person off about cardiologists is probably a kind of arrogance, mm-hmm. if I had to guess, that they perceive in the elite, you know, the the person who has all that money and did all that education and lives that kind of lifestyle that's not accessible to me. I'm reading into this, but just based on people that I knew. Yeah, there's there's a kind of envy masquerading as a contempt of arrogance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that that is a little psychoanalyzing this person. But when I held views like that, or, or when my you know relatives critique me <laughs> in ways like that, mm-hmm. it seems to come from a place of I'm the humble one, right? And I'm critiquing the arrogant who are in this unearned place yep. that I could be in if I had had the right life circumstances. Yeah. 
So I mentioned graciousness, right, and gra- the interesting relationship between humility and grace uh, a minute ago. There's this quote that stuck with me that I heard, I don't know when I heard it, but years ago from Dallas Willard, who most of the listeners might know as a popular Christian author, but I knew as a philosopher because he was uh, an expert on Edmund Husserl, wrote some really interesting analysis of his early logical work, which is some of the most difficult philosophy I've ever read. So I respected him as a philosopher before I ever read any of his popular Mm -hmm. stuff. And one of the things that he was fond of doing was like pithy aphorisms and like trying to sum up things that were very complex and in very simple ways. This is a good example of humility, I think, because you would never know the depth of his philosophical acumen from reading his popular work. Hmm. Um, You would need to. And if you met him and talked to him, you would come away thinking he was just a nice guy who was interested in you probably and had a knack for phrasing things. And so he said one time, one of the hardest things in the world is to be right and not hurt other people with it. Hmm. And he likened that to grace. He said being right is actually a very hard burden to be able to carry gracefully and humbly. And so I think those things are related because I think I've been right a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've hurt a lot of people with it. I've, I've experienced that firsthand. I've seen it in their face. I've walked away from the conversation and regretted it. And it's difficult. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's not lying. Um, and yeah, it's a, dis- it's a discipline. He's like well known for writing about disciplines and treating other people gently with your knowledge mm-hmm. is a discipline. It's, and it's, this is the way I can tie it in with Christianity because to me, humility is a universal virtue. It's as accessible to the pagan and the atheist as it is to any Christian I've ever known. And I can't say the most humble people I've known were necessarily Christians. Some of them were, some of them weren't. But graciousness, I think, I need to think more about this, but I'm going to say it, <laughs> is a uniquely Christian virtue. Hmm. Um, it's It's bound up in the nature of Christ, and it's not something that out of a secular ethical system you would naturally reach for, necessarily. Um, it's not obviously justified on some secular mm-hmm. ethical systems. And so how you wield your knowledge has, I think, some unique Christian force. Yeah. When you think of it through the terms of grace. Yeah. No, it's good. that's beautiful. I love it. What I found when interacting with all sorts of Christians, and even many pastors and church leaders, none of my close friends, but... Trying to separate faith from certainty is a completely foreign idea for so many Christians. It's literally like you're speaking a different language when you try to get a Christian to see that what they believe is just literally what they believe and not what they empirically know, right? Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before, but I want to drill down just a little bit more because I think we're all susceptible to this. I'm shocked every time I come across a, a follower of Christ, a person who's in authority, even a leader in the church, who's like... What, what, what do you mean when you say certainty? And then we'll go into it and all that stuff. And they'll even quote from the book of Hebrews of like, yeah. hold, to, hold to your faith with certainty, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about faith, certainty, what, like, how we can actually not be certain about what we believe and yeah. try to convince the, the skeptic? Yeah, so longtime listeners will be familiar with this rant, but here we go. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, certainty is impossible. It's not, it's not a thing that humans are capable of attaining. Uh, there were a couple of philosophers who thought that you could, and no one agreed with them. <laughs> Some of them were very influential in the history of philosophy, but like their arguments are notoriously weak and have been refuted. Uh, Descartes looking at you. Uh, so mm-hmm. like certainty, if you, if you understand certainty as there is at least one belief that I know to be true, that it's unassailable and that it must be true, that it can't be false, that if it were false, I would know nothing, that everything else would go away. And so everything rests on that foundation, that kind of certainty. It's just, it's both unattainable and uh, dangerous because when you, you can build a belief structure in that way. And you can um, feel really safe in it for a long time. But the more you build on it, the weaker it becomes because that foundation of belief is actually not certain. (laughs) And so it can't bear that amount of weight. And so it doesn't take much to put a little puncture in it. Mm -hmm. And one puncture leads to another and leads to another. And then eventually the whole thing crumbles and you have the deconstruction that's currently happening. But this sort of thing has happened countless times throughout history. It's not a new phenomenon at all. And so certainty is impossible for anybody, the religious person or the non-religious person. It's just not a thing. Uh, What is a thing is uh, kind of fallible confidence. So I can have evidence and I can follow that evidence and I can build beliefs on top of it and I can be open to new information and I can change my beliefs as the new information comes and I can act. It's not like I'm frozen in skepticism, Mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, I can do things. I can get a job and I can have a family and I can have friends and I can develop interests and projects and all that stuff and still remain open to new information changing what I think is true. Mm -hmm. Because there are a basic number of things that I can be really sure about, right? I can be sure there's an external world. I can be sure my wife loves me because she's still here. I can be sure that bourbon is delicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like There's all sorts of things I can be reasonably confident about. And a lot of those things contribute a great deal of happiness to my life. And I just don't need, and this is one of the things that the people who are deconstructing are waking up to is the realization that so many fundamentalists tried to keep them from desperately, which is that I can be happy without that. I don't need certainty. I don't need the feeling that this is all important and so high stakes. And that if I let go of this one thing, the whole thing crumbles. I'm a much happier person. Yeah. <laughs> not thinking that in that way. Yeah. No, that's the, that's the thing is the minute you kiss certainty goodbye, which we all should in particular to our faith, the more enjoyable your faith journey yeah. gets, the more relaxed you get to be because yeah. you're not constantly trying to prove something that can't be proven. Right. You know what I'm talking and about? Yeah, right. So to bring it back to faith, which you asked me about, certainty and faith are incompatible. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they're uneasy bedfellows. Like you can't have Definitively one. Definitively <laughs> incompatible. Like just think about it for a minute. Like if you were certain, what role would faith play? None. There wouldn't be any. You presumably, if you if you're if you're a good, uh, always been a Christian, and this is feeling difficult for you. Ask yourself: Does God have faith? And it just seems weird to say that God mm -hmm. has faith in Himself, right, mm -hmm. or herself. Like, why would God need that? God knows. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, if if you like, there's a inverse correlation between confidence and faith, uh, and if you max out one, you zero out the other. But that's fine because faith was never intended to be that. We can have a whole separate episode about faith. Yeah. But if you dig into the worldviews, this is the one area maybe in which I'm like a historical critical <laughs> proponent here. Knew, yeah. Knew you'd come around. The, the worldviews of the people who wrote and compiled the Bible just didn't include what we now consider certainty, mm -hmm. like a kind of epistemic scientific precision. Yeah. They didn't have that. It was pre-scientific. Yeah. They had philosophy and they had ideas of high confidence and whatever, knowledge. But the people that compiled the scriptures were not interested in that. They were interested in trust and they were interested in a kind of relational confidence. And it's just a kind of unfortunate trick of language and translation that the words that would have signified that to them, to us, mean something like, uh, doxastic confidence or belief. Uh, faith and belief just aren't the same thing. No. Faith and certainty aren't the same thing. Right, but certainty is just maxing out the confidence in your belief. Sure. Right? Sure. So if you think that faith is a matter of belief, well, then the best kind of faith is the certain kind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Yes. But they're not. If you divorce those fundamental concepts and you think of faith as, uh, you know, a relational kind of trust, and it's got a few other aspects too, then it it just it shifts your whole orientation towards what your religious life should be. Yeah, yeah, and I've noticed we we get words mixed up a lot. Faith doesn't just because you don't you're not certain about something doesn't mean something not reliable, mm -hmm. right? Just because something is trustworthy doesn't mean that it's certain. Right. We get these terms mixed up. I I was I made a statement recently of how I'm not interested in the question of is the Bible inerrant or infallible. The questions about the Bible that I'm interested in are questions like. Have you been transformed by the person of Christ that you met in the Bible? Or mm. d have you let these ancient stories challenge the way you actually live and interact with the real world around you today? Those are questions that I'm interested in. And somebody replied and said, man, if the church was asking those questions 40 years ago, I might have stuck around. Mm -hmm. And it just made me sad because yeah. that's what we're lacking. Yeah. Is this humility to the way we approach our sacred texts. Yeah. It's so sad because somebody in the church was asking those questions 40 years ago and 100 years ago and 1,000 mm -hmm. years ago. It's always been present, but we've created these communities where we shut all of that out because of certainty, because the smaller your kingdom is, the easier it is to hold tight control over it. So if we can make it seem like, you know, villainize all that big old tradition, then it becomes easier to control. Yeah, I think it's why we have such a pushback against the deconstruction movement, yeah. because we choose hubris over humility. We choose certainty over humility. And I think that's why, like you have said, where a lot of the deconstruction has come from. So I wonder what might it look like 
to be a religious person, a spiritual person who holds firmly to humility. We've mentioned Fred Rogers. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your pastor. I mentioned my senior year religion teacher. I want to submit Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. How much do you know about Mother Teresa? A a bit. She she made, (laughs) after her death, her uh, diaries were published, which I'm, I feel really conflicted about because there's a lot of really interesting insight in there, but also she didn't want them published. And so reading them is kind of a weird experience, but philosophers picked up on it. Philosophers of religion did because Mm. she had some deep doubt um, and she was a really good example of someone who you would think would be a paragon of all of the religious virtues and who for periods was probably accurately described as an atheist and may have died in, in that kind of space and sought, you know, extensive religious counsel to no avail. And so mm-hmm. um, she became a kind of talking point amongst philosophers thinking about faith for a while. The idea of a person who struggles with doubt their whole life, doubt about what they've given their life to, doubt about what they believe about the realest things about the cosmos, doubt about their experience of God and not hearing from God, doubt about whether prayer is is effective and does anything in the world. I'm describing Mother Teresa right here. Like Mother Teresa is famous for having living her. She had more doubts than faith, I would say in some ways. But in spite of all that, in spite of the uncertainty, in spite of the unknowability, in spite of the reality that she knew she couldn't really know about whether God exists, she gave her life to the least of these. She Mm -hmm. followed Jesus in his call more clearly than I think probably anyone we could ever imagine in recent history, in memory. And that just, to me, that's this picture of humility that says, I don't know, but this is beautiful and I'm going to give myself to it and I'm going to give my life to it, even though I stay up every night wondering if this whole thing is real or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There must have been something that she was convicted of that kept her going, right? So like, I can be super unsure in the throes of doubt, maybe full on disbelieve some religious propositions that I think give meaning to the work that I've chosen. But when I do the work, I can see the value in it. Maybe I see it in the face of the person who's dying in front of me in the case of mother Teresa, or I see it in my own case is very divorced from that. But like, you know, maybe I see some value in the good that I'm doing through, you know, my writing or through the, the students I'm helping or whatever. I want to affirm as a virtue the commitment and the resilience to stick to that good Mm -hmm. that you can perceive despite not understanding it and not being able to justify it within your system. Yeah. I want to be cautious about saying that someone who finds themselves in that deep, dark place, that the answer always is to just... sure. Stick keep on keeping on, yeah, because <laughs> she was deeply unhappy, mm-hmm. um, and I can't say for sure that she should have kept going. Right? She, you know, humbly submitted herself to her religious authorities and took their guidance and did what she did, and she did a great deal of good in the world, and she's, you know, canonized for a good reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but saints are rarely happy. Sure, and I can't say for sure. <laughs> I can't like advise that for someone else, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think what resonates deeply within it for me is the humility to say, I don't know, you know, like mm-hmm. I want to say, I know, I want, I want to say, I know that the Bible is the authoritative, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. Yeah. It's perfect. The end. I like, I, that'd be really convenient. That'd be really nice. I can't say it if I'm mm-hmm. honest and I'm humble. I can't say that I'm, I'm, a hundred percent certain that the resurrection actually happened or yeah. that, you know, you could go down on the list. I'd love to be certain about those things, but I can't do it. But I think, and this is just, I'm just guessing from mother Teresa's experience because this is my experience. But what I do know is that the way of Jesus is the most beautiful way that I've ever come across. Like I haven't come across a better way of living, a better ethic of living, a better way of treating humanity, a better way of living my life than what I find in the four gospels. And that, I can hold to and keep moving forward with because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's what Mother Teresa was holding to. Yeah. I'm curious what what would happen. This is a hypothetical. It may be impossible to get yourself in that position. But let's say your confidence in those things you just described, the picture of Jesus you find in the Gospels, let's say that is shaken. Let's say you continue on this trajectory away from the fundamentalism that, you know, described your past. And eventually you don't see, for example, 
love as the meta narrative of the New Testament anymore. Just the other day, a person, a philosopher who I really respect, posted something about that very thing, about love being a relatively minor facet of Jesus's teaching. And it, it kind of shook me. It made me kind of reorient and question some of the things that I had taken for granted. And I would need to dig more deeply into it to, to reckon with that. But let's say you got to the place where you weren't so sure anymore about the centrality of that kind of thing to Christianity. Would your humility stay intact? <laughs> I don't know how much humility would have to do with it as as much as just if I wasn't convinced that the way of Jesus is the way of love, I don't think I would be interested in it anymore. Yeah, that would be the result of a humble orientation. But that's an interesting thing to acknowledge if you think that they come from a similar place. Like if my picture of humility is Jesus, (laughs) right? And then I come to think that maybe he's not the way, let's say. Does humility look differently for me at that point? This is all hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Very similar to that question that we keep returning to about resurrection. If the yep. thing that seems core to me now were to shift, because it's shifted in the past, right? The things Absolutely. I thought were core are no longer. Um, yeah, what would my orientation be? Would it continue in the trajectory? or would? Yeah, would I think a humble be? disposition would say, I don't know. I, mm-hmm. I do know it's. I'm going to change. I don't know how I'm going to change and what direction. Yeah. Um, but as I said in the previous episode, like I really hope I stick with Jesus because I like Jesus a lot. Yes, and I appreciate the honesty of that, the simplicity of that. The I like this. <laughs> There's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that. You know, yeah. it's the thing that James Dobson was terrified of <laughs> that someone would justify their life ethic with. This seems good to me. <laughs> yeah. I like this, and it's not hurting anybody. It seems good. Why me. Why not yeah. be motivated by the goodness rather than exactly. the fear, right? Yeah. So th- speaking of Jesus, another reason that this came up in my headspace is because I was, I'm preaching through the Gospel of John in my church at Bruce City Church, Hala Friends. <laughs> um, and I, I got to John 9. And, jo- you know, the, the book of John, it's a little anti-Semitic. It's, it's, mm. it's full of arguments between the religious leaders and Jesus. And in John 9, it's no different, just this massive monster argument that the religious leaders are picking with Jesus. And towards the end, he said something that just totally stopped me in my tracks, and because I think it, it gets lost on us. But in John nine thirty nine, Jesus said this, For judgment I have come into this world, that the blind will see, and that those who see will become blind. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that again. For judgment I have come into this world, that the blind will see, and that those who see will become blind. Now, I think we listen to a statement by Jesus like that, and we just kind of toss it into the the whole like paradoxes. The last first will be last and the last will be first, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. This is just the way Jesus spoke. He's kind of odd like that, but whatever. Gloss over it and go to the next clear thing. But if you actually listen to what Jesus is saying there, I think he's saying something completely profound and very, very rare within Christianity and with religiosity in general. So let me first before I I don't want to I wanted to be the preacher man. What's your take <laughs> on that? on that quote by Jesus. Oh gosh, that's yeah, that's one of those things that I would need to know more about how it was compiled to have like any I feel like I was just riffing on something that I didn't really understand. I know it comes at the end of him healing the blind man with the mud, right? Yes. And yeah. uh, so you know it's connected with an actual healing of blindness and so there's part of that. There's a play on words that the author is inserting there about, you know, spiritual blindness and physical blindness. Um, and then there's Religious leaders also in the context who are questioning him, are we the blind ones and just totally missing the point, right? Mm -hmm. So beyond it being a kind of rhetorical play for whoever those religious leaders were, I have no idea. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, this guy was, he had just gotten kicked out of the synagogue, which means you got kicked out of, he was already a marginalized person. He was a blind beggar. And all of a sudden he receives sight. And the religious leaders are kicking out anybody out of the synagogue who affiliate themselves with Jesus or who, who follow Jesus. The guy's parents even disavow their kid because mm-hmm. they don't want to be kicked out of the synagogue, which isn't totally to their you know discredit. It's because they want to have a livelihood. Like if you get kicked out of the synagogue, you're kicked out of the power chain and yeah. you're, you're kicked to the side. This guy didn't care and he let himself. And he Jesus then, it's ironic to me that after he gets kicked out of the synagogue, after he gets kicked out of the place of power and religion, then Jesus comes and talks to him. And they they, they chat a little bit, and then he says that, for judgment I have come into the world, that the blind would see, and that those who see will, are blind. And here's my take on it, and this is very, very simplified, and I, I don't think it's the correct take. But I just think Jesus is trying to say, look, dudes, you're all blind. Hmm. 
and when you think you see actually when you think you found the truth is the moment that you become blind yeah like when you when you actually feel like i know this certainly that my scriptures are true and i i have i have researched and studied the scriptures and i'm confident and the bible tells me to be confident and have an answer day in and day out you know for in whatever conditions i'm in and i've got it damn it yeah i feel like jesus is saying the moment you have that feeling you become blind and not in the good way you you right. actually can't see the truth anymore god himself comes in the incarnation and it's the religious people who think they got everything figured out who can't see god himself when they're standing right before their eyes yeah and so th- to me the challenge is pastor randy guy who's been preaching from the scriptures for 16 years and studying them and think i know a lot and i'm pretty good at it don't you dare ever think that you've you, you've found the light you've you've been illuminated in this way that like you see now and you're going to help others see that's that's how i think that's how we think mm-hmm. is that i'm going to bring the truth to other people and i'm going to illuminate the scriptures in god's it's like word in your job description right <laughs> that's pretty much it but actually probably i think jesus is saying here in john 9 39 your job is to let everybody know that you don't know what you're talking about you haven't found the truth you you haven't attained to much and you're still seeking and f- your, your disposition is that of a seeker your disposition is that of like jesus says in the sermon on the mount seek and you will find knock and the door will, will be open to you ask and you will have an answer and i think jesus is just saying have a life disposition of seeking have mm-hmm. a life disposition of asking questions have a life disposition of knocking on doors because then you'll actually in the end you'll find things yeah. you'll you'll the revelation will come to you if you spend your life having the posture of a humble seeker, not a person who's figured it all out. Yeah, and a couple of verses later, he says to the Pharisees, now that you say we see, your sin remains, which yeah. I think really confirms what you're saying. I totally overlooked that. Not that I read the Bible a lot these days, but I totally <laughs> overlooked that, that passage because it's easy to skip because it's really short. It's right at the end mm-hmm. of that healing and then it goes on to a different thing. No, that's kind of profound. Yeah, it's the the confidence of being sure, you know, that I'm the one that f- has figured this out because of my training. And uh, that's actually keeping you from seeing yeah. the truth. Yeah. yeah. The last thing I want to hit on is this is not something newfangled, right? We're not talking about this new postmodern, you know, millennial <laughs> mumbo jumbo that's trying to wreck, you know, our, you know our I'm Christian a millennial, faith. Right? <laughs> I'm saying this in jest. Like I'm, I'm trying to become a Theo. Bro I'm saying that's some, not new yeah. anymore. That's like we, we're like two generations past. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. But there's this whole tradition that our faith was kind of founded on, really in many ways, called the apophatic tradition or apophatic mm. theology. We talked about this many episodes ago with Samir and or not, yeah, Samir and Sherid. Sherid Yadav. Thank you. Samir Yadav is a Duke educated. Uh, theologian. He's brilliant. He's fun. You should listen to the episode, Two Pastors and Two Philosophers Walk Into a Bar, if you haven't listened to it. We've plugged a lot of episodes on this episode. <laughs> right. Too many. It's because we talk about this so much. Because we're so humble. <laughs> um, but Samir has studied extensively in the apophatic tradition, and he quoted Augustine, and he said, basically, Augustine said, and he said it in Latin, and I don't know how to speak Latin, so he basically, <laughs> he, Augustine said, if you can understand it, it's not God. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's basically going to this ineffability of God or the unknowability of God. Yeah. We get most modern day Christians would get really scared with the tradition, but actually like Clement of Alexandria was kind of a, a father of the epiphatic movement. Gregory of Nyssa. I mean, these are giants of church fathers. Augustine, again, basically we're very clear that we can't know God. Like Augustine said, the minute you think you understand God, you're not talking about God anymore. Stanley Hauerwas, we were talking to Stanley months ago Hmm. and he said basically the same thing right but our faith is founded on and has its roots from this idea and this tradition that we're going to try our best to know god throughout our lives that's that's our life's vocation is to to know christ to know god to pursue god to follow after the way of jesus while knowing that we can't ever know god like god is god is not a being like we are a being god is beyond us god is completely other I think it was Paul Tillich who said, God is the ground of all being. Yeah. I do remember Stanley saying one time, don't read Paul Tillich. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. <laughs> but we live in this paradox, and the church fathers have handed this paradox to us as followers of Christ in 2022, which is pursue Jesus, follow Jesus, do your best to live like Jesus while knowing you'll never know God. You'll never fully understand God. Because once you feel like you fully understand God, Augustine said, 
you know you're not talking about God anymore yeah. because we can't understand him. Yeah, and that's Augustine, folks. That's not, <laughs> we're not Argue talking about a want. fringe figure here. That's, yeah, for a hilarious take on the ineffability of God, you should read Terry Pratchett's book, Small Gods. Interesting. Thank me later. <laughs> So maybe we should just define apophatic for those listeners who might be a little confused. Um, so there's this, and again, not a theologian here, so not my area, but there's a distinction between apophatic and cataphatic. And yes. so apophatic is approaching God from the posture of unknowing uh, and negation. So God mm -hmm. is not. So the, the way we can approach knowledge of the ineffable is by saying what it isn't. Um, and interestingly, there's um, that happens a lot in the East, and it's kind of known for that, but it also happens some in the West, and people as, uh, you know, central to uh, Roman Catholic doctrine as Augustine and Aquinas had yep. very firm apophatic strains in their thought. And then uh, the cataphatic side is we can have knowledge of God. We can, uh, we can have arguments, we can have rational arguments about metaphysics, and we can know something about God's nature. And I don't think anybody ever thought we could exhaust it, but we can we can have firm knowledge, and there's also revealed knowledge. And there's room for both, right? Exactly, yes, yes. All the, the great theologians, or most of them anyway, uh, recognized the, there's truth in both traditions, mm -hmm. and it's important to, to try to marry them if you can. Yeah, the reason I wanted to to finish with these church fathers who began this apophatic tradition that really didn't start with them. It goes back through the Jewish tradition and who knows where it started because this is what we've been given in our faith. It's not what we've received from the James Dobson's and the John MacArthur's and the holding up to certainty with everything that we have. It's Jesus way of saying we're all blind. And the more you know that the more you'll understand me, the more you'll, you'll, you'll find me if you realize that you're blind I want to be part of a tradition that holds that humility and holds that as a virtue and not as a weakness. I want to be part of a faith tradition that looks more like Jesus and Fred Rogers than James Dobson and John MacArthur. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it for this episode of A Pastor and a Philosopher Walk Into a Bar. We hope you're enjoying the show as much as we are. Help us continue to create compelling content and reach a wider audience by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash a pastor and a philosopher, where you can get bonus content, extra perks, and a general feeling of being a good person. Also, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, and Spotify. These help new people discover the show, and we may even read your review in a future episode, if it's good enough. If anything you said really pissed you off, or if you just have a question you'd like us to answer, or if you'd just like to send us booze, send us an email at pastorandphilosopher at gmail.com. Catch all of our hot takes on Twitter at, at PPWBpodcast, at Randy Nye, and at Robert K. Whitaker, and find transcripts and links to all of our episodes at pastorandphilosopher.buzzsprout.com. See you next time. Cheers. <laughs>